Well, it is, uh, it's so good to be in church this year. Remember last year, that uh, last Easter, it was an entirely different scene, at least here in Colorado, that uh, churches were not together. We were online, and, and uh, we had that, that, that virtual engagement, if you will, that was happening. And so uh, what, a, uh, what a difference a year makes for sure, that's true. Uh, but uh, to you guys that are here today, and, and also, in fact, let's put our hands together for all the folks that are watching online. Well, welcome online visitors. We're glad you're there. Yes. Uh, we hope you're blessed online as well. Uh, but but uh, here we are doing, uh, uh, you know, an Easter service, a resurrection service here at Westminster Calvary. Uh, our first service this morning at sunrise was a wonderful time. Uh, we had an opportunity to go through Luke 24 and to share uh, some of the things around the resurrection there. Uh, and today, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look in, in the Gospel of John. So we're going to move from Luke and we're going to go to the Gospel of John, John chapter 20. And uh, many of the uh, passages that we'll look at or as we navigate through this chapter, a lot of these things are going to be here on the screen. Um, but I want to make sure that we're starting off with positioning our hearts in the right way. And so, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen and Amen. That is super important to start this service off in that way because of the certainty of what Christ has done. It is, uh, <laughs> I don't want to say it's a nail in the coffin because it's the, not. <laughs> it's the, <laughs> that wouldn't fit, right? <laughs> no, the stone has been moved, okay? It's been rolled and Christ is no longer in the grave. Uh, and we know that this, uh, you know, the resurrection is the capstone of Christianity. It's the capstone of the work of Jesus. It's the completed work. We know that it's, the, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's really an indication of the, the future promises that will come to the believer in Jesus Christ. That, that these bodies, this, these corruptible bodies will one day will also be raised in the like capacity. The, the corruptible will put on incorruption, that we too will have a resurrected body. And so the Apostle Paul, he tells us this, in 1 Corinthians 15 and 14, he says that if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. So we know the importance of the resurrection. We know that it is the capstone of the gospel. We also know this from, from uh, the Apostle Paul. He also says that if Christ has not been raised, then our faith is useless and we're still guilty of our sins. Mm. If you're taking... Uh, notes uh, this morning, I put a title on today's message, What Are You Looking For? What are you looking for? There, there are all kinds of opportunities through our daily, our yearly, our monthly life to look to Jesus. For we know that, that he calls out, the Spirit of God is always looking to, to draw people to himself, to bring people to the cross, maybe I should say. And when it comes to the scene that we're going to take a look at today, it is so fascinating and so interesting that as we look through the Gospels, that, that when we get to this portion around the resurrection, what we find within the Gospels is not the talking about the general masses, but rather here at the resurrection, we find that the Gospel writers, that they zero in on the responses of those that were close to Christ. Very, very, very interesting thing. And so as, as we're going to see these uh, four different responses here today, as we're going to take a look at these different responses just by walking our way simply through the chapter, please know that these are close followers of Jesus Christ. And even there in first century Christianity, at the very first resurrection, okay, that, that, that the disciples that walk with Jesus, that physically touched him in so many capacities, that they physically saw him with their own eyeballs, being standing right in the same spot of seeing the miracles and seeing all the different things that Jesus did, they still wrestled with the resurrection. They still wrestled on that particular morning. And what do we know from that? Very simply, we know that why you and I, why we can go and we can visit Israel today, we can go and we can, you know, go to Gordon's tomb and we can kind of take a look at, at oh, okay, this is, this is it or something like this. And, and, and we can flash back and, and we can get all the, the taste and the textures of all that stuff. Ultimately, we must understand that just like the forgiveness of sins, it is something that we have to receive by faith. Super important. And so I ask you this morning before we begin, what are you looking for here on Easter 2021? What are you looking for as, as, as you have come out to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Some of you are, are regular attenders. Some of you are visitors. 
Uh, some of you walk very closely with Jesus. Others of you may not even know Jesus, or, 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 or maybe you wrestle before the Lord with staying consistent or faithful, if you will. Uh, maybe, maybe there's many that wrestle with that aspect of doubt and unbelief and all of that stuff. Listen, these are all very real human responses. And, and while Jesus answers and he gives us a very sure word and why the, why the uh, epistles from the apostles, it lays down Christian living and, and, and it firms up all of that, yet it does come down to a personal decision that every man, woman, and child will have to make. And I ask you today, what are you looking for? What are you looking for on this Easter? John chapter 20 verses 1 to 4 says this. John writes, he says, now... On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene, she went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and she came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and, and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. And so they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and, and came to the tomb first. We've got four different responses here that we're going to see in this chapter. In verse number five, we're going to see the response of John as a young man, maybe a late teenager, we could, we could even say. We're going to see Peter in verse number six, that, that, that his response, and, and, and he was a guy, he was a fisherman, a little bit more of a tougher guy, if you will, okay, a little bit definitely older than, uh, uh, than where John was. We're going to see Mary in verse number 12. You know, this is the gal that Jesus cast out seven demons from. I mean, she was tormented beyond tormented. You know, she's the person that you see walking down Wadsworth Parkway here, talking to herself and chewing on her tongue, if you will. This woman experienced such an amazing healing from the Lord. And she's also a woman that followed very closely after that. Thomas in verse 25, towards the end of the chapter, this guy, this guy really upholds his name, and we'll see that at the end here, you know, doubting Thomas. Uh, this guy says, I am not going to believe these things unless I can take my finger and put it in the hole of his wombs. I'm not going to believe. I don't care what you guys are saying. You're off your rocker until I see it with my own eyes. I'm not going to believe. And Jesus gives him some of his most powerful and directed words to doubting Thomas, you know, things that you and I could learn even here today. And so in this chapter, catch this concept right here that I'm fixing to lay out to you. If you, get, if you catch nothing else, catch the concept of what goes on within this chapter because it makes understanding this chapter so much more easy. In this chapter, there's three critical words that we see here in the English. And there's a collection of different Greek words that show up. And, and these words are saw, seen, and see. Three different vantage points of what happens here within this text. These are, is coming from the vantage point of the each of the individual interaction and what they're looking for and what they're expecting when they come to the tomb. Their response to the resurrection of Christ. And so verse five, take a look at that. It says, and he, speaking of John, stooping down and looking in, he saw the linen cloth lying there, yet he did not go in. And so when John shows up here in verse number five, what do we have happening here? Well, this particular Greek word, it, 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 it indicates nothing more than he physically looked from the outside. He went over, he's like, okay, he looks at it, he sees it, and boom, that's it. That's all he did. It was just that, that, that quick, just, just quick peek into there, and that nothing more else was attached to that. John got there first. He had to poke fun in the text and say, hey, I, 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 out, I outran old man Peter, that slow guy. I got here first. I took a peek in, and that was it. Nothing more. Very simple. And then we see in verse 6 and 7, take a look at this. It says that Simon Peter, that he came following John, and he went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. And we've got a different word that shows up here. In the, in the English, in your English Bibles, we read these as the same word. In the original text, it is not so. They are different words, and they're indicating something different. Now, this one here with Peter, this describes that as, as, as Peter goes in, his curiosity is totally peaked, and he's looking intently. He's looking. He's, it's, it's like he's in there searching with a magnifying glass, if you will. He is searching for the clues. He's like, what is this all about? What is going on? 
And so this word describes that he gave this careful observation, that he studied the scene to make sure that he was taking it all in. As he looks, he sees that there, the clothes that were the grave clothes, you know, the, the, um, maybe we could see it or remember it, you know, like the, the mummy type of wrappings, if you will, the, the cloths that were wrapped, wrapped around Jesus' body. He sees these things there, but he doesn't see the body. There is no body. And Peter's in this place. He's like going, wait a minute. What is going on here? What's happening? Yet again, God was getting his attention even there at the tomb. And now we go back, verse number eight, and, and, and watch this because the scene flips again. It says, then the other disciple, this is young man John again. He said, who came to the tomb first, he went in also, and he saw, and he believed. As John comes in this time, first time, just peek, done, that was it. The second time he comes, right behind Peter, he goes into this tomb. He looks inside there, and, and, and his immediate response is that childlike faith. He looked, he saw, he believed. That was it. It was a done deal for John right there. And, and, and what the word means in this particular case, it means to know and to fully understand that John took that second peek, he took that second look into the empty tomb on resurrection morning, and on that second look, he, he fully understood, he knew. Maybe you're here today taking a second look at God. Maybe you're here today because mom brought you. Maybe you're here today because a family member has been praying for you. Maybe you're here today because you know things are not right between you and God. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you've tuned in online because you're, you're you know, maybe like Mary Magdalene, that you're in a very tough spot where, where the conditions around your life are shattered. Maybe you're, maybe you're in such a ripe spot that the condition of your heart is just so ready to believe in something else because life has failed you, and the frustrations have been real in there. Listen, John, when he took this second look, he fully understood. Verse number nine, take a look on the screen for this one. Coming out of the New Living Translation, it says this. It says, for until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said that Jesus must rise from the dead. All the way up to this particular point as this narrative is unfolding and, and, and the pieces that John is giving to us, at, at this point, it all came together. That, that all the stuff that Jesus had talked about when he had the disciples down in the Galilean region, in Capernaum and, and, and around the, the Sea of Galilee and all this stuff, all the things that Jesus was, was telling his disciples, suddenly in an instant, bam, that stuff flashed right back before John's mind. And that childlike faith, when he peeked into there for that second look, it, 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 it sprung to life, if you will. It was amazing. Scroll down to verse number 11 now. Now, in these verses, 11 through 16, and, and maybe I'll just pluck away at them here, we're, we're, we're turning the corner to yet another perspective here, okay? It says, but Mary, she stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and she looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet with the body of Jesus Elaine. And so we should understand that as Mary is looking here, she's coming forward in a way to where very much like what Peter was looking, okay? You know how he was kind of really just searching, searching, searching it out there? That, that she is in this area, but she, the interest that is behind her is that there's, a, there's an intensity, but that intensity is cured by that curiosity. She's trying to, again, she's sleuthing it out, man. She's trying to put these pieces together. What in the world can this possibly mean? Now, we know that, that in the Gospel of Luke, Luke in 24, that Luke gives us a different vantage point because before this event that is happening right here, what the angels that appeared to, to Mary and the other women that were with her uh, when it was still dark, right? At that time when the stone was first rolled away and, and Jesus' body was resurrected up, okay? And the, and the women came upon this, the tomb. We know at that time that one of the angels communicated to Mary and told her, reminded her about what Jesus must do, that he must die and rise again. And so she left early on with that already ingrained upon her heart. 
Now this second pass or this second look of the tomb right here with Mary, as she's looking in, she's, she, she's trying, again, she's sleuthing this out, trying to put all the pieces together. And you know, that can speak to us in so many different ways. Maybe in your Christian walk, you haven't understood what God has done. Maybe in your Christian walk, you haven't been able to recognize the fingerprints of God. You're not alone with that because the scriptures is replete with people that have been overwhelmed by circumstances, people that have been overwhelmed by emotions, people that have been overwhelmed by pressure. And we stand one year, maybe a little over a year now, after the start of COVID, after the changing of everything that's gone on globally, after all the changes that have taken place within our, our country, and still we're in this transformative moment where morality is being changed right before our eyes. The, 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 the anchor points of what God has put in, that God has created the male and female. The, the anchor points of what God has is, is laid down in Scripture in, in the aspect regarding marriage and, and all of these hot points of our moment. These are real things, folks, within our culture. These are real things that the Scripture addresses and that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever or more. We know that. And maybe you're taking a second look here on this Easter morning and going, wait a minute, is church really essential? Is God really essential? Do I really need him in my life? And I would, I, I, I would plead with you and I would say, yes, you need him in your life. Because you can have this life and this life can, you know, this life doesn't have to always be lived or is always lived, I should say, in shambles, in disrepair. It doesn't mean that life is always that way. You can have an amazingly good life and you can be, quite frankly, a moral person. But it does not handle the sin problem. And, and, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the back of the cross of Jesus Christ some three days later here, we understand the penalty that Christ paid and now the certainty and the finality where the believer in Christ is accepted before God and the proof of that and the authenticity of that message is, is right here demonstrated that Jesus said that he would give his life but he would also take it up again and now the proof is what's not in the tomb. The proof is there. But do you have that proof in your life? You, you, the, 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 that we live in a time right now where cultural Christianity is something that has blown up off the charts. That we got all kinds of people raising the, in, in, in identifying the cultural Christian thing, but it's not a biblical Christianity because there's so many of the lines that are crossed. The morality is the one, is, is the chief one, if you will. You want to know where a person is at when they, when they raise the flag of Christianity. You take a look at the fruits that are coming from their life. You, you, you take a look at what the belief thing is. Because if there's a skewing of the belief, then there's a changing of the Bible. And if you change the Bible, it is no longer from the author. It becomes from you. And the ways of man in his own eyes, they seem right. They seem wise. They seem appropriate. But the Bible tells us that the end of that stuff is death. We, 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 we put ourselves on a collision course with, with no doubt a good God. But when we strip out the teeth that he set within the gospel and the direction that in the ways that he's called us to receive that grace, not, not performance, folks. We're not talking about performance here. This is the receiving of a gift. But if we pull all of his, his truth out of this and think that we have that truth, then we become nothing more than a cultural Christian. We are dictating what we want before a holy God, and it doesn't work that way. And just like these disciples that are showing up at the tomb on the morning of the resurrection, that there they are looking into this stuff that they didn't understand. And you may not understand the ways of God. And I would say that you would be very scripturally accurate that way because Isaiah says that his ways are above our ways and past for finding out. And yet Jeremiah tells us that if we call to God, that he will answer us. Jeremiah 33 and 3, if we call to him, he'll answer us and he'll show us great and mighty things which we do not know that God will unfold the scriptures to you and I, that God desires to reveal himself to you and I. And the way that he has done that is, is primarily through his word. But it doesn't mean that God can't inter, inter, intervene into the most difficult of situations, because he can. We have some visitors today, perhaps, Perhaps online, perhaps here in the sanctuary. I don't know. I can't see all your faces. I see that you're there, but the lights are just perfectly in my eyeballs. So I can't see if you're smiling, if you're wearing a mask, if you're giving me the stink eye, or if you're ready to throw a tomato at me. I can't tell. 
That's the glorious part about standing right here. <laughs> Go, Jesus. <laughs> you know. But I would tell you this, that God understands. Many of you know my story. That on that day, May 7th, 1993, at about 8 o'clock at nighttime, not in a religious capacity, but a guy, a 21-year-old young man, nearly 30 years ago, I shoved a 9-millimeter gun in my mouth. My wife and my baby daughter in the other room, and I'm ready to take my life. Let me tell you, in that particular moment, there was no priestly garb, there was no religious sayings. The only thing that was there was me as a broken man in a bedroom, crying out to God, saying, God, if you're real, I need your help. Now, God didn't manifest himself in that room, I'll tell you that, but God showed up in that room. He showed up in that room in such a way as is that, the, that, that the aching pain that was within my heart that needed to be touched and relieved that somehow in that second of time, God did that. And I sensed that something else was going on in that room. Yeah, listen, the lights didn't flash. You know, there was no triumphal music and everything that was happening, but there was a clear distinction that before that second, before that moment, that I was this way, and then I wasn't. And the only thing in between as it comes off of that chosen movie the only thing in between those two spots was Jesus. Jesus took my sin. That's my story. Your story may be more radical. Your, may, your story may be less radical. Who cares? Do you have the story? Do you have that story to where you've come to Christ, to where you've made that profession of faith? Because I, I've had the opportunity over the years to, to talk to people and they've never had that experience with Christ. There's never that relational thing. Well, I just kind of grew up in this way or I've kind of understood this from afar from my parents. The Bible's not talking about that. The Bible is talking about a personal relationship between you and God, which is only borne out through Jesus Christ. And the look that is happening here with these four different responses on resurrection morning at the tomb and, and, and about Jesus is what they're going to do with this. Once again, in verse number 12, it says that she, Mary, she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. A little bit of time has happened from right there at the break of sunrise to where she's at now. A little bit of time has passed. Same day, same morning, you know, within the same handful of hours, but a little bit of time is gone. In verse 14, it says, now, when she had said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus. Here's another saw. He was standing there. And she didn't know that it was Jesus. So at verse 14, while she was looking like Peter to, to try to sleuth out the details and to get the clues and everything, she's trying to figure this whole thing out. Listen, she was looking so hard at the scene that was set right there before her. And there was this huge, deep, emotional rift that was going on with inside of her. And no doubt, no doubt, the fond affections of what she had because of what Christ had done for her in days gone by. I mean, this is, this is a woman that we find at the foot of the cross. This is the woman that we find, the first one that shows up to the tomb here, this, this very morning of the resurrection morning. There was a deep emotional interest. But guess what? Look at the text she missed that it was Jesus. She missed that Jesus was standing right there. She was emotionally overwhelmed and she couldn't recognize God's handprint. She couldn't recognize his voice. She didn't recognize that that was Jesus right there who she was searching for. And so many people, they wrestle with God and they don't understand the Lord tells us within the word that his people perish for a lack of knowledge, for, for ignorance, for a lack of understanding. Maybe we could take the Hebrew text and break it down into English that way. That, 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 that God's people perish. Good men and women derail themselves because they don't know God 
personally. They don't know his ways. They're not familiar with them. And symptomatically, folks, if I had personal relationships with all of you and I could get right up against that guardrail of, of where relationship rubs against relationship, you know, where that skin on skin is happening, that, that person-to-person interaction is happening, I would ask you some very serious and real questions. Do you know that we're at the end of the age? Do you know that Jesus is coming back? Do you understand that according to what the scripture teaches starting out in chapter one, very first verse of the book of Revelation, that the indication that Christ gives that he is coming back again is not a particular date. No man knows the day or the hour. That's very plain, that's very clear. But the conditions are called out. And when he says that these things must shortly take place, he's not talking about a span of time. It's been 2,000 years, folks. That's not what he's talking about. The Hebrew text, excuse me, the Greek text reveals to us that, that when you begin to see these types of things fall apart within the world, then you can understand that, that things are ramping up very rapidly and you are to look up, you are to draw close that much more, that you are to remember as Hebrews, the book of Hebrews tells us, that we are to encourage and we're to stir each other up to love and to good works, but to, to stay close to Christ, to assemble all the more as we see the day approaching. And, and, and that Revelation chapter one text, while it is not an Easter text, it is, it, it is a text where, where many or some near and far here or online, you may not hear ever again. But you should understand the proclamation of the gospel message is that God's attitude towards sinners is that of grace. And what he desires is that as we look into the resurrection, that it moves us into, a, in, into this avenue to where we look to him with trust, where we look to him with faith, to where we begin to surrender our, our lives. And, 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 and as we hear the scriptures unfolded to us, that we would know him, that epigonosco as the Greek word is, that, that we would take the information that we're getting here, all the biblical texts and all of this stuff, but it would be coupled together with the person of Jesus Christ, the epigenosco, the two of them, the, the head knowledge and the heartbeat, that we would realize that, that it is this, it is the words of God that lead us to the person of Jesus Christ. And as these words, as they lead us to the person of Jesus Christ, there's a, there's a decision that every man, woman, and child has to make, and it's a decision that can only be born out in faith. It is not by logic. What is the logic, what is the scientific proof, what is the data that you have that a man can come alive again? Well, maybe he wasn't all the way dead or you know, maybe 45 minutes passed and we jump-started his heart in a different way. Fine, great. This sucker was dead, he was dead for three stinking days. He was, at that point, no bueno. It's just the reality of it. It's for real, but it can only be received by faith. And now the text changes, and, and we advance ourselves a little bit farther here. Moving, moving your eyes all the way down here to verse 24. Take a look at this response. Actually, maybe I should set up the text for you. Let's see, where am I at with time? Well, we're still on time. That's amazing. Hmm. <laughs> Gee whiz, how in the world? Uh, let, me, let me just read this to you to give you a little uh, contextual flavor here as to the, the flow of, of uh, the scenes that are happening. Verse number 19, it says... Uh, then that same day at evening time, okay? Uh, so, so here we've gone from uh, right as the opening of the sun, right? Right at dark, the stone was rolled away. We've moved through a few things. We've seen this interaction at the tomb. Okay, now the day is advancing here and we're at the evening time. Okay, and what was happening? Still the same day. It says that when the doors were shut, the disciples were assembled uh, for fear of the Jews. Okay, so the disciples are hiding out behind locked doors because they're afraid. Listen, their Lord, their God, the, their rabbi, the teacher that they were following, Jesus, that the religious Jews in a political capacity, they just took Christ and they crucified him, and, and, and the whole thing was a sham. They knew that. And as his followers, they're hiding behind the doors because they're in fear for their life as well. And it says that Jesus came and he stood in the midst and he said to them, peace be with you. Uh, some translate this literal text is, is nothing more than this, that, 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 that peace is with you. That Jesus shows up and he's saying in the middle of this, right behind that locked door, and he's saying, peace is with you. I'm here, boys. I'm here, folks. Don't get rattled. Don't be afraid. 
Perfect love casts out fear, First John tells us. And this is what Jesus is saying. He's the embodiment of peace. He was their protection. He was the one that was taking care of them. He shows up right there behind that locked door as their afraid, little fraidy cats right there. He says, peace be with you. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they, oh, here's that word, when they saw the Lord. Now this particular one is, is this, this particular saw, it describes that they knew by observation. That, that in that moment, when they could tangibly put their hands on it, they knew. And that was it. They knew. Well, the text goes on down, and, and, and we find ourselves in verse 24, okay? And this is about a week later, about eight days later, is, is what it tells us here. It says, now Thomas, this is our fourth character here, Thomas called the, uh, called the twin, one of the 12, he was with him when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. Excuse me, he was not with them, okay? And the disciples said, we have seen the Lord. And so Thomas said to them, unless I see in his hands the prints of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Doubting Thomas is here. This is him. He shows up after Jesus had already come and gone. And, 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 and now here's that point where it's eight days later, okay? Verse 26. It says, and after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. So Thomas is there this time. He missed the first showing of Christ. He didn't get out to the first service. He went to the second service, okay? That's what happened here. So he's there at the second service. Well, what was going on? Well, Jesus came. The door's being shut still. It's a week into this, and the doors are still shut. And he stood in the midst and he said, peace to you. And then he said to Thomas, he says, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. And notice what Jesus' words finish off in this particular verse. These are some of the most toughest words that Jesus has to Thomas or to you or I. Because these are the words that, that, that bring that it brings us to a crossroad of decision. What am I going to do? He says, do not be unbelieving, but believing. Now, Thomas has a choice. No, Lord, or yes. But there's an oxymoron because you can't say no, Lord. Why? Well, if he's Lord, then, then that means that you, are in, you should be in submission to him and what he's told you to do. So you can't say no, Lord. It's yes, Lord. Thomas had this particular response, the fourth response, because he wanted to experience because of his doubt. And Jesus tells him, don't be unbelieving, but believing. We could interpret that in all kinds of ways. We, we can say, listen, Thomas, don't be a thick-headed knucklehead and continue to remain in this place of unbelief. Don't, Jesus is telling him, don't stay there in that. It's only going to hurt you. It's like you slammed your finger in, a, in, in, in one of your cupboard drawers or something. You're putting away silverware and you close the drawer and it's like, and you, you, know, you pop the tip of your finger and go, well, I think I want to do that again. That hurt. Let me try that one more time. This is the Lord tells him, listen, don't do this. But I want to make it personal. And I think this is what the scripture does. I think the scripture takes it and it makes it personal. On resurrection morning, you should know that this is not some religious process that we are going through that, 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 that that we are gathered here in this fellowship, whether you're in person or you're online, that we, are, we have a gathered here very specifically to see what the empty tomb is all about, to celebrate the empty tomb, to make a decision, maybe to make a new decision, maybe to receive mercy and grace afresh. I don't know what your personal story is, but we're here for a reason. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the guarantee that Jesus' message is authentic, that it's real. He's genuine. It's not something that's made up. And yet in this very chapter, and what, what we've seen so far is that we see that Jesus meets people right where they're at. And I think that's important for us to remember here in 2021 because of all the stuff that is going on before us and the landscape of our society is changing. 
Listen, we have households of moms and dads. We have, and, and kids. We have households where it's just mom and kids. We have households where it's just dad and kids. We have single people. We have divorced people. We have people that have gone through widows, we, uh, you know, in that widowhood aspect. We've, 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 we have people here that have suffered uh, death. We've lost a dear sister just recently at the beginning of the year from this fellowship in a, in a very tragic and sudden way. We have people here that, uh, this, is, this is to the tune of two very specific people, that because of a history of, of, of abortions that they couldn't have babies and God did something and they've had babies. Amazing. I don't know how that all works. I, I mean, who, who, can, who can get credit for that? No man, only God. But regardless of what you've been through, the answer and the remedy is still the same. What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with the empty tomb? What will you do with the resurrection of Christ? What will you do when the words of Christ collide with the customs of your community? What will you do when you're put into a spot and in, 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 in into a position to where either you're going to choose to stand with Jesus and suffer the consequences of that at work, amongst friends, in your family? Or you're going to choose to compromise and deny Christ? I don't know. But I know that the increasing pressure that is all about us has left families fractured. And I need to, I need to get back to why I laid the families out in all that direction. Because here in this fellowship... And I don't know which parent or how many parents I'm speaking to in this, that you have kids that are still within your house, that are under your tutelage, they're under your provision, and they don't know Jesus, and you let them get away with it. Mm -mm. It doesn't work that way, folks. That's a heavy word. Listen, your kids are going through a lot right now because of what they're being taught within schools. This is no longer about monkey business. It's far beyond monkey business. Listen, the banana's been thrown out. It's all gone. It ain't that no more. This is about the fundamental fact of male and female, the fundamental fact of creation and the foundation of what Christ has said. Whether you agree with him or you don't agree with him, you take that up with God. Because I'm, I'm not a God's defender. God can defend himself. But the reality of it is, is that our kids are being taught in a totally different, you know, the canvas is, has, been, has been erased and is being written in such a way that there is, it's just lunacy. And guess what happens? You begin to move in that direction and now you're right back in first century Christianity because the maneuvers that were going on at the time of Jesus' crucifixion and his resurrection, there was a lot of political press and, 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 and policy and problems that were coming down. Yes, from the Roman rule over Israel. Yes, but also from within inside of Israel and the religious leaders and all of the stuff that was being done. And it's exactly the same crap that we see today. That we have people that are in the framework of the church and that are leading churches and they're endorsing and they're taking on these things that are counter-Christian, that are counter-biblical. And they're embracing stuff to where it is enslaving people. And folks, it's happening more and more and more and more. And my question to you is, what will you do with the cross? What will you do with the tomb? What will you do? What is your response to the middle of all of this stuff that is going on? What's your response? John had a life where he saw, where he heard, where he believed it was a simple faith. He was not a perfect young man. It's a simple belief. Peter, this guy had a more difficult life, and it was very difficult for him because he was such an impulsive guy. And, 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 and let truth be known, he was a rough guy. He was a fisherman. You know what? I identify with Peter. I'm just a rough guy. I, I'm not polished. I'm not well-spoken. My tongue's been burned halfway off and it grew back. I've had a gun in my mouth. I'm, listen, if you're looking for some, some guy that's in an ivory tower or you're looking for a church where, 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 where folks are really super sharp and all that, you're in the wrong place. But I am just a regular old Joe here. And in the middle of that, I have a heart for Jesus. I'm not a perfect man. But Peter wasn't a perfect man either. He was a rough guy and he'd physically hurt others. 
And he struggled with staying faithful. And we know this already, that, that just a few days before this, that, 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 that Peter denied Jesus three times. And now here, they're at the empty tomb, and man, he lost hope again. And, and what did he do? Well, John 21 and 3 tells us, he says, I'm going fishing. He goes back to his old ways. Mary, as we wrap this down now, Mary, why she had this strong loyalty to Jesus, yet in this, what we've seen here in John 20, she was overwhelmed emotionally because of what she saw. Yeah, she was healed from demon possession. Mm -hmm. God touched her. Yeah, she was the first at the cross. Yeah, she was the first at the tomb. Yep. And, and, and even right here, she's the first to grab hold of Jesus, for sure. You know what's so fascinating about her? Is that she was a woman that was a thousand percent committed to Christ. She didn't care what it was going to cost her. She was completely sold out. After she was touched by Jesus, her life being healed and made whole, she was all in. Now, Thomas, <laughs> we end with Thomas. Listen, this is cupcake. And I call him a cupcake. Mm -mm. We'll get to meet him one day too, by the way. So uh, it's going to be an interesting conversation with him. Thomas, what were you thinking? Listen, this, this, uh, Thomas, uh, maybe, uh, maybe his life collides with some of your lives. Okay, I, I already told you who I was. I'm, I'm Peter. I'm, okay, I've screwed it up pretty bad. But Thomas... This guy was the most self-centered man. And you know what? It required the most dramatic situation for him to change, to him to acknowledge. Jesus gave the words, hey, don't be unbelieving, but believing. Jesus had to bring him right down to that narrow point and say, hey, listen, it's me. But all of these responses are real people in real things. They're, it's, it's real. They're real responses to the resurrection. But as we close, I'd like to ask you, now that I've got your attention, because of all the changing tones and dynamics even here in this room, what's your response to the cross? What's your response? Are you bored with Jesus? Are you opposed to Jesus? Do you doubt Jesus? Are you ashamed to come to Jesus? Are you too busy for Jesus? Could you care less about Jesus? Are you just here because somebody drug you in to hear about Jesus? All of these things, they're real questions and they're only responses that, that individually that you or I can respond to. And while the work starts within our hearts individually, the work carries out within our home and that what goes on inside the framework of our home spills out into our communities. If the heart of man is jacked up, the home of man is jacked up and the community at large is messed up. Now, if we put deductive reasoning on that and we look at the community and we work our way backwards, we come to the message of Jesus Christ who bridges the gap between a sinful, messed up man Humanity, because of our hearts, because of our heart condition. And God desires to restore and to put that in, back in place. And God desires to offer his grace and his mercy afresh. And the resurrection is just nothing more than, than, than placing that, that certificate or that seal of guarantee, that seal of authenticity. But it still is an individual decision. The final verses that we'll read today, I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation, verse 30 and 31. It says this. It says, the disciples, they saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. And pay close attention to this, folks. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, it blows the natural, man's, natural man's mind. 
Why? Because it's a supernatural event. And a supernatural event can only be understood by faith. And so I ask you, as I invite the worship team to come back forward, I ask you one more time, what do you see this morning at the resurrection of Jesus Christ? What do you see in the empty tomb? What do you understand about the cross? What do you understand about God's love for you? What do you understand about what Jesus offers you? Notice I said offers. He didn't say you had to come and pay for it. He didn't say you had to work harder. He didn't say you had to, to, to do all these particular things to be accepted. What do you understand about his offer to you? As we, I guess before we sing this last song, I want to make sure that on this resurrection morning that that in the privacy of your own heart that you understand God's grace to you personally. Personally. Not the guy next to you. Not your spouse. Not your kids. Not your friend that you came with. No, no, no. You personally. And so many times that we can come to church and we can hear a message and we feel that we feel that conviction within the heart. And if it's not properly understood, sometimes we might even feel that, well, it's condemnation. You should know this, folks. The condemnation is not of the Lord. He doesn't condemn anybody. We're already condemned because of our actions, is what the Scripture says. But what Jesus offers, and many times of what can be felt inside the, uh, the sanctuary or, 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 or in, 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 a, in a response to understanding the word of God can be a real conviction that falls. It's like, yep, I missed that one. And passing out the grace of God becomes all the more important, especially on a time like this, a morning like this. And so I want to make sure that I'm administering God's grace to you across a spectrum of things. It's for you to accept or not to accept. You do that in the privacy of your heart, but I want you to understand that there is a choice before God right this second. Before all of the hosts of heaven and the throne of God, there is a choice right now to receive his goodness or to reject his goodness. And what we understand from the scriptures is the more that you reject, the easier it is to reject. The more that you deaden your conscience, the more conscious dead you are towards God. In his grace, because he desires to give that, I would pass it to you in four ways. The first one is this, to accept the love of God and to have your sins forgiven. Please understand, from the Lord to you, that's what he wants to give. He wants you to accept his love. The second thing would be this, is, is to confess that, that maybe you've become like Peter Peter had a hard life. Peter denied Jesus three times. Peter, even after the examination of the tomb, he went back to fishing. And maybe you've been like Peter. Maybe it's time to confess and to turn around. Or maybe, maybe you've seen some radical things happen and you've been like Mary in days gone by where you were all in. But you've stopped trusting him. You no longer have an active faith. You, you, you have the name Christian, but it's not an active faith anymore. You're just holding a title, you know. Look at my title here. I'm Christian. It's just a title. God would, would call to you in a very special way and say, trust me again. Or maybe you're in a place here this morning where you just need, you just need to receive Hope because of the complexity of the time in which we live. You don't know the right way. You don't know the right things. You don't have the answers to all the pressure that is upon your life. That's okay. But these are all little ways to accept the grace of God. And notice that each one is different. Can I ask you this? Is there anybody that needs to take God up on his grace this morning? If so, would you please raise your hand up? 
also with you folks that are online. As we look to you online, you can, you can raise your hand right there. And I turn my attention back to you. Okay, I see you guys keep flagging me on the line portion there. I'd like to ask that you put your hands up high. In fact, I'd ask that you do something differently, that you would stand to your feet. Please don't be shy about this. We're all here together. We're all in the middle of this. God is working. God is ministering. God is doing amazing things, and he desires to give us those second chances. And this morning, it's a second opportunity for you to take a look at the message of Jesus Christ. And I know that in a room right here with this many people that is right in this place, I know. I know there's all kinds of people in here to receive this. And I see these that have stood up here. Before we go out of here today, do you feel God knocking on your heart? Do you feel like that guy is talking to me? Do you feel like if he wasn't so brash and abrupt and just messed up, well, maybe I would respond, listen, you're not looking to the man being me. You're looking to the man. You're looking to Jesus. Anybody else? Anybody else would stand to your feet here today? And so the rest of us, may we gather around these. Stand to your feet, please. Father, we thank you that you're alive. We thank you that you've sent your spirit who lives within us right now. And we thank you, Jesus, that you died and that you were able to not only to lay your life down, but to take it up again and that you have fulfilled all righteousness for us. And I pray over to the top of this body of believers here, I thank you for these that have responded in person. I thank you for these that have responded online. I thank you. And I'm asking for your special provision of grace to renew and to restart and to carry. You're very plain in your word, and you said that that work which you began, that you will be faithful to complete it. And so, Lord, may you complete the work. For the rest of these individuals that have come out here today, some are just passing through, some are here with, as a guest, some are, are, are exploring. I pray, Father, that if there be any in here that are holding their response from you, I pray that maybe this message would be nothing more than a pointed rock within their shoe. It's one of those things that as they're walking through the day, that they sense that it's there and you would bring them to the crossroad of decision. And I pray that you'd break any, many more free. You're bringing this to my mind right now. I don't know how this applies over these that are here. But the religiosity that you absolutely despise. I pray that you'd break many more out of the religiosity. But we do look to you today in this time, and I know this is, <laughs> I think we probably all showed up to here, not, not quite thinking that this would be so intense. And yet we are at the crossroads of eternity, and this is what you've brought today. So I'm praying for your grace and your mercy to go forward. And I pray, Father, that even on me as a man, as I communicate your truths to people, that you'd have mercy upon me. You wash me of my sins as well. Lord, I trust you, and I entrust all of these lives to you once again. I'm commending them to you. And I pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.